So, future of retail from a global perspective. As I was driving here today, I was thinking about kind of how retail has come and kind of the interplay with e-commerce, and that's kind of an ongoing battle that we've been seeing for the past few years. Um, there was once a day when retail was king. If you wanted to buy something from a store, you had to walk to the store, you had to drive to the store, you had to bike to the store. You couldn't buy anything online. You had to go to the store in order to purchase something. And then the internet came along, and with that came e-commerce. And the main benefit of e-commerce was that you can easily select different items, compare the prices, and really optimize for price. Um, but kind of the challenge of e-commerce early on was this idea of trust and how, at the end of the day, people still wanted to go into retail stores because you were able to see what you were purchasing, know that you can get it immediately, know that you can actually use it, know that it fits, and know that you can return it. And that was the big challenge that e-commerce had early on, which was how do you get the trust of consumers? Ironically, I think the movement and trend has shifted since then, since e-commerce overcame that trust issue by allowing for personalization, allowing you to actually be able to figure out what you want to buy before you even know what you want to buy, provide recommendations, know what you bought in the past in order to determine and help you decide what to buy in the future. And ironically, I think retail has fallen behind on that. Nowadays, you go into a retail store, it's generally just a very large store. No one knows what you purchased in the past. No one has any recommendations for what you should purchase. And no one even knows your name anymore. And e-commerce has really won the battle in that front. But I think at the end of the day, retail is still going to survive. And if I were to summarize the future of retail in about 20 seconds, I think about this clip from the movie Minority Report. If you think about the future of retail, it's really about being able to walk into a store, having dynamic interactions, people knowing what you want to purchase, people being able to walk in and people already know what are your sizes, what are the sizes of all of your family members, being able to have custom advertisements and really a custom dynamic experience. So that's probably a 20 second summary of the future of retail. And I could end the talk right here, but I'll dive into a couple of technologies that I think are really going to disrupt how we think about retail in the future. The first one being indoor location tracking. So if we think about indoor location tracking, what do I mean by that? Essentially being able to have, um, being able to see in the future that where your customers are moving around in a retail store, as well as how frequently they're interacting with specific products. With that, you can actually get more data on your customers, figure out where certain products should be placed, which ones are more popular, and really kind of um, optimize that experience. On the customer side, currently we have a lot of solutions and opportunities to do GPS tracking within a large street, getting from building A to building B, for example. But when we walk into a shopping mall like IFC, for example, we have absolutely no idea how to use a GPS map on our phone to figure out how to get to one store to the other. Or even within, for example, a large department store, figuring out how to get from one section to another. With indoor location tracking, we can actually be able to figure out, quickly identify where a product is and just use our phone and our indoor GPS to figure out immediately how to get to that product. I actually backed a company called Wi-Fi Slam, which is able to um, track your location using your phone within a 0.5 meter accuracy. And that company was acquired by Apple and Apple currently uses their technology, which is a combination between Wi-Fi and sensors and NFC to actually figure out and better accurately indoor location track where you are. Another technology that comes to mind, computer vision and recognition. If we think about what we want to purchase, very, very early on, the role of mannequins. So people like to see what they might want to purchase, and they idolize images like mannequins to figure out what they might want to wear or buy. That's changed now, however. If we think about what has replaced what was mannequins in the retail store, it's really been social media, photos on Instagram, photos on Facebook, 
currently there's over half a billion monthly active users on Instagram, over 1.5 billion monthly active users on Facebook. And nowadays, if we look at the generation that has fully embraced social media, it's no longer about walking to the retail store and figuring out what you want to wear based on mannequins. It's about opening your phone, looking at who's on your Instagram, following Instagram celebrities, um, for example, Kendall and Gigi being two of them, and being able to look at what they're wearing and wanting to know immediately what you want to wear. And with computer vision and recognition technology today, you can actually see a photo, um, have that image be processed, and actually figure out where you can buy that exact same shirt that that Instagram model or Facebook model is wearing. I think that's one example of just kind of the power of computer vision and recognition. So, Maybe using um, your new computer vision technology, you've decided what exactly you want to wear or what exactly you want to purchase. How do you actually get the item now? There's a lot of innovation in the space that we've seen so far around click and collect and this model. Basically being able to buy something online, buy something on your mobile phone, on your desktop browser, and instantly be able to just pick it up in the store. One example of a company that has really disrupted that in my mind is Starbucks. So with Starbucks, you can actually go on your mobile phone, open up the mobile app, and see where the nearest Starbucks locations are near you, and be able to purchase a drink, um, choose what kind of milk you want, um, figure out based on your past purchases what you might actually want today, and then instantly go into the store, not have to wait in line, and just go straight to the pickup counter and actually pick up a Starbucks. That's one example of a click and collect model. Another company in Silicon Valley that has really disrupted that is a company called Order Ahead. So instead of providing just one integrated experience within Starbucks, they provide more of a platform experience. So with Order Ahead, they actually show about a dozen or two dozen restaurants that are near you. You can be able to figure out what you might want for lunch, order it on your phone, pay for it, and then instantly go into the restaurant without having to wait and actually um, be able to pick up your food order. So compared to Starbucks, Order Ahead doesn't have as much of an integrated customer experience. They don't know what you might have purchased in the past at that specific restaurant. However, they make up for that with optionality and being able to select from a number of different restaurants. So just moving forward and talking about a couple other different technologies, if we think about dynamic pricing. So Within the e-commerce world today, if you look at a company like Amazon, they actually make a change in their prices on an average about ten, uh, one time every 10 minutes, and every day about two and a half million changes to prices are made on Amazon. We haven't really seen that as much in the retail experience in terms of changes of pricing, which doesn't just consist of trying to have the lowest price possible based on what your uh, competitors are pricing out, but also figuring out what should be the optimal price based on, for example, the time of day, what's the demand for the product, and really having dynamic pricing that way. In Singapore, however, if you look at a couple of grocery stores and convenience stores, they have prices that they place in digital placeholders, like over here, and they're actually able to dynamically change the price based on what competitors are pricing it, based on the time of day, based on the demand. And I think this is actually just one example of disruption in retail, dynamic pricing, and eventually we're gonna see that translate into what I call dynamic interactions and dynamic experiences. So you're not just going to walk into the store and see how the price changes, but you're gonna walk into the store and see how advertisements change based on who's walking into the store. You're going to be able to see how products are changed and move around, maybe not um, currently once a week, but almost every half an hour, how products are changed. And just overall, kind of a more dynamic experience. Um, very similar to, actually, I showed earlier the clip from Minority Report and having very, very dynamic interactions when you walk into the retail experience. If I think about another disruption that's happening in the space, I don't think we can skip talking about mobile payments. Mo by mobile payments, we've seen a lot of changes with companies like Apple doing Apple Pay, Samsung with Samsung Pay, even banks like Chase, Chase Pay, and also apps like Venmo, for example. And we've seen mobile payments be adopted at an incredibly fast rate and really disrupt the typical credit card industry. So if I think about retailers today, for example, a lot of your information is encrypted, your personal information is encrypted on a credit card. 
And then that credit card is then processed using a credit card reader that the merchant has to actually go through and sign up and actually get that done. However, if I think about disruption in the space, I think at the end of the day, all of that processing, all of the payment processing is eventually going to be happening on the consumer's cell phone device. So as a merchant, all you have to do is print out a QR scanner, which is very, very simple, very similar to actually just printing out a price tag, and all of the credit card processing is going to end up happening on the consumer phone and device, and we won't need to have credit card scanners or credit cards anymore. Kind of related to mobile payments is this idea of fraud detection. So currently, if you look at merchants overall globally, about one to 2% of revenue is lost every year because of fraud. So that actually amounts to, if you think about it, billions and billions of dollars every single year. And a lot of fraud detection that occurs right now is very manual, and that's very expensive. So for example, if a product, um, if a purchase is flagged as potentially fraud, that often goes through a manual review process, and then that in turn gets determined whether it's maybe a fraudulent purchase or not. In the future, I think we'll definitely see a lot of these processes more automated. We're starting to see that right now using big data analysis to actually automate fraud detection. However, I think the real future of this that we're really starting to see is this idea of biometrics. So being able to identify someone based on, for example, their fingerprint um, or other physical characteristics that are unique to an individual. So with the fingerprint scanning, we've seen this very present today already with Apple Pay and also Samsung Pay. So using your existing mobile device and the fingerprint scanning, we can actually determine very quickly if you are who you say you are. And in the future, it's going to expand beyond just fingerprint scanning to include being able to analyze, for example, your DNA, your retina, and other physical characteristics. And the great thing about this when you think about all these biometrics when it comes to fraud detection is that it's very, very difficult to spoof your identity. It's very difficult to do that. So if I think about another important disruption that's in the space, this idea of loyalty programs, it's a very cheap way to actually engage your customers frequently. And there is some innovation that's happening in the space. Traditionally, we've seen a lot of loyalty programs be very points-based. So basically, you get one point for every dollar you spend and get some sort of cash back or gift card because of that. There's, however, a couple disruptions that are happening in the space. For example, this idea of just non-monetary based rewards. So instead of just collecting points and being able to get some sort of gift card or cash back, being able to, for example, sign up for Yogurtland and their loyalty program and get, we all love, hopefully, frozen yogurt, so a free cup of frozen yogurt. Or, for example, Kroger, for example, is doing a really innovative program in which for every single dollar you spent, you do get points, but you can actually choose to donate the money back to your local charity or nonprofit organization. So this idea of you're not just getting, as a customer, money back, but being able to, for example, donate to your local nonprofit. Or even, for example, Walgreens, which is similar to, in Hong Kong, what we would consider Family Mart or 7-Eleven, if for every single step that you take and just for being able to walk and run and stay healthy on a regular basis, you can actually earn points for that and actually get gift cards just by walking every day. And Walgreens has engaged its customers that way. So if I were to think about maybe in just five bullet points, predictions for the future. One, I talked about indoor location tracking. I think that's going to completely disrupt how we think about interacting and moving about a retail space, how we see customers actually move around our store, how we see customers interact with products, and also, in general, just the entire dynamic experience from that. That being one prediction. Another one around computer vision and recognition, and this idea of being able to blur the lines between social media fashion, as well as e-commerce, and know instantly just from seeing a photo how we can get that item within just a couple of minutes and instantly purchase it online. Another aspect being fraud detection and the movement away from that for more manual processes that are very costly, but more towards biometrics and more automated processes. Another point around mobile payments and actually uh, disruption in that space, and I think the adoption of mobile payments is going to be faster than any change we've seen before in the payment structure, faster than the change from cash to credit cards, and um, in general, just the fastest adoption that we've ever seen in payments so far. 
And then the only thing I'm for certain about is this idea of hyper change. So this idea that we're going to have dynamic pricing, dynamic predictions, uh, dynamic presentation, and dynamic interactions um, within the retail experience. Everything's going to be personalized and customized based on who you are walking into the store. And I know in the audience there's um, a couple of you who are small business owners, retail owners, and um, what are some kind of recommendations that I would recommend for you to adopt today? Um, very first one would be this idea of being able to collect data on customers early and collect data now. That's the most cutting advantage you can have is if you're able to have information on your customers that you can then provide personalized recommendations for. So I highly recommend adopting an intelligent point of sales POS system so you can immediately start doing that and provide marketing solutions tailored to your customers. Second aspect is being able to embrace mobile payments early on. And my biggest recommendation for that is if we look at what Starbucks did with their mobile app and being able to um, process payments and also provide other services, what Starbucks did was they wanted to make sure that the experience was optimized for a small percentage of people. So if you're able to adopt mobile payments on mobile and make that experience optimal for just one to 5% of your customer base, don't worry about the cost of that. Really make sure it's an optimized experience. I think it will go a long way. And then finally, third, being able to create or join a loyalty program and being able to engage your customers that way and most importantly, make sure that loyalty program is available on mobile. And when you think about doing that, being open to also joining a larger loyalty program so you can acquire customers from other stores and whatnot. So those are my short recommendations. 